Good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you might be located. Uh, I'm Eric Miskell, publisher of EMS Now, and welcome to the EMS, the Eric Miskell Show. We certainly appreciate those of you who have uh, decided to join us here today for this discussion. A couple of quick ho uh, housekeeping issues before I introduce the show today. Uh, everybody is on mute. If you wish to pose a question, please use the uh, Q&A function tab at the bottom of the screen. And as always, we are recording this session and it will be broadcast on EMS Now either this Friday or Monday. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm not sure where it is in the, uh, in the queue right now. Um, as always, I'd like to thank my co-host Phil Stoughton for joining me and continuing our collaboration on these. Um, our show today will consider the pandemic as an accelerator of digital disruption and new business models that disrupt the norm in this rapidly changing world. So um, really it's the future of electronics manufacturing in a nutshell, right? Um, our two guests today are both CEOs of companies that are exactly such companies. They're, they're uh, disruptors in their place. They're leveraging the uh, digital transformation. Um, I never know where to point because this appears differently later. So let me just say, uh, currently upper left of my screen uh, is Amar Hanswal, CEO of Bright Machines. And currently on the bottom left of my screen uh, is Misha Goshtin of the CEO of MacroFab. So gentlemen, welcome and thank you for uh, your participation today. Um, before we get into kind of the discussion, why don't we ask each of you to maybe start with you, Amar, kind of give a brief description of your company for those people who've been living on an island and don't know who you are yet. Oh, th thanks, Eric. It's great to be on the show and uh, good, uh, to have this chance to uh, talk to, to you and your audience. Uh, Bright Machines is a company that's founded on the principle of accelerating automation. And uh, we are a software first company. So what we're trying to do is build intelligent software to really accelerate and improve the ec economics of uh, automation. And we've specifically focused on uh, you know co companies building electronic centric products, so you know the kinds of things that EMS companies do, um, and uh, we've been focused really on the back end of production lines, so on assembly and inspection, and trying to bring automation to a historically analog labor centric uh, part of the production process. Okay, thank you, Misha. Um, yes, thank you for having me on the show, and Eric, good to talk to you again. Um, as Amar mentioned, uh, I think our both companies are focused on the electronics manufacturing space. We're, uh, we're a software-first company as well, but I think we focus on a different stage of production, and we focus on the front end. Uh, there is a lot of uh, um, complexity and difficulty in uh, just understanding what customers are trying to build, but then also uh, connecting that, you know, digitizing those jobs and then placing them in the right factories. So Microfab built a much better way to uh, source electronics manufacturing. Uh, we have a network of over 50 uh, factories in North America. So anywhere between Canada, US and Mexico. Um, and our customers use our platform to source anything from single unit prototypes to very high volume uh, production and hundreds of thousands of units. But Essentially, the way it works is we turn those factories into a cloud-like resource. And what that means is that um, we can help our customers decouple from the physical factory. There is obviously a factory building your product, but uh, you don't have single points of failure. Um, you're, in fact, we have uh, uh, even small to mid-sized customers that are being built in multiple factories. So as, you know, as we learned um, uh, with, with this experience with the global pandemic is that um, supply chains are very brittle, while our customers experienced very little disruption because even as some factories were shutting down, others were very much open and we were able to reroute their manufacturing capacity uh, anywhere. So that's a snapshot of, of what we mm -hmm. do. Uh, we obviously didn't build this for the, uh, for the pandemic scenario, but there's a lot of benefits in using software and algorithms to choose where your production is going to go. And I actually think long term, all of these technologies are going to come together. Uh, in terms of automation yeah. in the back end and then automation on the front end. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, Misha, that, I mean, it's really interesting what you say. You didn't build what you've got there for the pandemic, but it kind of fared unusually well and your customers fared unusually well in the, in the pandemic as a result of what you did build. Amar, have you found that to be a similar scenario with, with your customers? Because that whole idea of choice and adaptability mm -hmm. and flexibility and the resilience you get by having that choice and that digital thread has been really important. Has that served you and your customers well during this time? I would say, yeah, for sure, uh, Philip. I think uh, what we've experienced is an acceleration in the adoption of automation. So what we thought would take five years to do is now starting to take, you know, five months would be a little bit of an exaggeration to say, but it's really accelerated a huge amount. Um, and there's a few reasons for it. I mean, I think a pandemic has really highlighted the dependency on access to physical space and the availability of labor as being a vulnerability in manufacturing, right? So if you really can't get to your factory and you cannot have the number of people you need to build your product, what are you going to do? And I think that's been the thing that people want to get ahead of. And when they look at automation and the fact that, you know, like in one particular example, we've reduced the number of humans required at a time from what used to be eight per shift down to three per shift. So they are able to, you know, manage through things like that. Uh, a, our software only approach enables people to do remote deployment, remote management of their infrastructure, manufacturing infrastructure. So just like data centers are managed on the other side of the glass, you can start to manage physical factory build, you know, building products the same way. So all these things have definitely accelerated conversations. And, you know, we're seeing uh, a, you know, probably a doubling in terms of the level of interest that people have had in deploying automation yeah. in just the last three or four months. Yeah, that's that's fascinating, isn't it? And I think there are kind of two things at play there. There's the there's the additional interest, but we seem to be in a good in a good space in terms of the building blocks that go into that. Whether that's the cloud um, availability and the elasticity you get from that, Misha, or whether it's AI and those kind of mm -hmm. technologies that can be the backbone of that. Have those things kind of prior to the um, pandemic were they? kind of catalyst to improvements in what you were doing? Are they things that have allowed you to create these, these newer business models? Perhaps you can take that first, Misha. Um, you know, when we talked to a lot of our customers uh, before the pandemic, uh, we, we saw a healthy amount of uh, interest in what we were doing. It obviously accelerated um, as the pandemic. We actually had our best quarters uh, in terms of bookings in the last uh, couple of quarters. Uh, even as we saw disruptions in supply chains and material uh, sourcing. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, we did see, especially in a supply chain management world, um, some, you know, quizzical looks uh, for a couple of years, uh, people saying, it, it sounds pretty fancy. Uh, why would I need to have software uh, driving my uh, sourcing? Why would I need software uh, driving my yeah. production? Uh, do I really need factory portability? And I think those questions are, much less uh, theoretical now. And I think that's actually been, um, and I don't think it's just a pandemic. Actually, we saw this start to happen even with the trade war. Um, I think we're exiting probably 10 to 20 years uh, period of very stable uh, trade routes. And, and, uh, and uh, for a long time, you know, you could be very global and, uh, and to, to some degree, choose you know to single source a lot of your um your um manufacturing and everything would work fine and all of a sudden it's not just one thing there's multiple vectors by which things are much more brittle so um like amar said it's accelerating people's thinking about what sh what yeah. should this look like if we were to fast forward 10 years from now can we afford the compounding effect of a trade war and then a pandemic and then some other you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, some other disruption. So all of a sudden, because, you know, the ironic thing is when you talk to software engineers, even when they're building trivial social media apps, those are very resilient applications. Uh, yeah. Supply chain uh, and, uh, and manufacturing sourcing, not as much, right? And I think that's probably yeah. a big change. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, I love that term, 
Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll let you speak in a minute. Eric, I love that term portability, though. I think it's really important at the moment. And everybody was, why do I need portability last year? And everybody is now, why don't I have portability? You know, they need to move stuff. Amar, when you look at portability and the ability to move stuff from one factory to another, is automation key to that, do you think? Is that a key enabler? Yeah, that's a great question, Philip. Look, I mean, I think you just have to look to another industry to see how they've enabled portability. And if you look at semiconductors, for example, you know, Intel has had this idea of copy exactly for many years. And so how have they done that? It's been, some of it is, you know, replicating the physical infrastructure, but a lot of it is replicating the digital instructions across factories and then whatever, compensating for whatever environmental conditions you have. So software is a huge enabler in terms of being able to make things portable. Um, and, you know, I could go into other industry examples of how, you know, data centers handle that and stuff, but, you know, I don't want to geek out on the audience. I do think that <laughs> really this mind to geek out. structure is the way to make things portable. And I think I, you know, build on what Misha was saying is that I think the manufacturing industry is entering a new phase where, you know, what was the uh, model of like building these large centralized factories halfway around the world is sort of evolving to, you know, build closer to where you sell. So distributed manufacturing, people are moving to that model with its second source or second, you know, like a second location or, you know, I think people are understanding that they, they could evolve that. And I think um, you, you asked earlier whether some of the, infrastructure pieces, whether it's cloud computing, cost of robotics, you know, all of those things have really come down in price and increased in usability to where, you know, some of the myths of the past where automation is expensive, automation takes too long, automation, like you can change all of that now. And I think the sort of portable manufacturing has become not just some kind of PowerPoint concept, but it's within reach economically and from a infrastructure perspective now. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, I keep been thinking a lot about the disruptive nature of the business models and uh, for both of your companies. And uh, I guess my question here is, is I look at it, both of you, like Misha, for what you guys do, the uh, elastic factory capacity, right? There were there have been attempts in the MS industry in the past through alliances and what have you to do this. And those really never proved successful. And Amara, you know, with, with yours, people have, have built kind of been trying to automate and do robotics things at the end, but they never, it never quite got the traction that, that right. the other ones did. So I guess my question is, is, you know, were, were those people just not bold enough? You know, what was the, what is it about your models that that's allowed you to, to or is it a timing issue with the digitalization and, you know, what is it about your models that allowed you to be successful here? I think it's timing and perspective. Uh, one thing I'll note is whoever was trying to do this before, uh, I don't believe had a software first uh, mindset. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll give You're you an right. example. Uh, this will both date me a little bit, but also give you a geographical understanding of where I am. I'm, I'm in Texas. Uh, at one point, I was talking to gas traders to teach them how to trade bandwidth. Um, it was a monumentally stupid idea where you trade bandwidth contracts and Enron, which obviously doesn't exist anymore, thought it was a, you know, it, it was a genius thing to do. You trade contracts <laughs> together, you, you turn uh, bandwidth into a commodity. Um, I think we tried to solve uh, in the electronics industry the problem the exact same way. People tried yeah. to uh, achieve uh, the decoupling from the factories and uh, factory portability by looking at this as a contractual construct. And it's not constructual, contractual at all, as Amara mentioned. At some point, you got to translate what a customer wants, which is a set of humans that may have a, uh, a set of design files, to something the machines can actually ingest. And you can only do that uh, with software, right? So I think software right. first mindset is probably the biggest thing. I don't think the technology is necessarily rocket science. Um, I think a lot of it is, I mean, it's we're talking about a lot of file formats. I think we're talking about a lot of uh, of ways to normalize this data. Uh, but at some point, somebody's got to build that stack. And uh, I mean, if you look at SaaS and cloud, I don't think it's necessarily like, a, I think SpaceX, they're flying to the moon. That's pretty impressive. Uh, this is just what- That is rocket science. It's ingenuity, right? So, um, but it's possible. I think it's perspective and timing. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'd agree with Misha. I mean, the software first, I mean, when I mean, it was equipment, you know, there's a certain sense of, um, if it's what you're providing is hardware, there's a certain set of finality to uh, the way things are. And, you know, the, if people have been buying equipment for 100 years, they are used to doing things a certain way. When it becomes a software first approach, you start to, you can reference SaaS and other models with, by which people have understood that they've gotten value. Um, and you're able to, education is a big part of that and, mm -hmm. and timing ties into that. I mean, the other thing I would say in our case is that the ability from the technology side um, you know, flexibility is built in now because again, using software, we can reconfigure the automation equipment. So it doesn't mm -hmm. become, Hey, once and one and done, like, okay, it can only right. build this one thing. It now is flexible enough to be used from, <laughs> you know, project to project. So it becomes a little bit more of a, Hey, I can see how this is a service as opposed to a, mm -hmm. you know, one time thing. So I think it's a 70% yeah. yeah. software, 30% technology yeah and business model and i like what eric said about about being bold and being bolder than people have been in the past because you can't half you can't half bake this you've got to you've got to do it a hundred percent amar how important is the as a service part of it i mean you've both used the term manufacturing as a service service or mm -hmm. micro factories as a service um what do you how how key is it is doing it a different way from a from a purchaser's point of view. Well, so let's start. I mean, if you start from the customer's point of view first, you know, you do not want your production system to go down ever. So, you know, the uptime reliability of your production line is is paramount. So hmm. you start there, and if what your service is doing is ensuring that it's hugely important to customers. And so mm -hmm. I think if you start from the point of view of the customer that what my, you know, our assembly as a service is enabling is guaranteed uptime, then, you know, people totally buy into that. You know, and so I think it's, uh, it's super important now how we go about doing it. What is the instrumentation we put in place? What's the, you know, the pool of talent we put in place to make that happen? That's on us, but from a customer's perspective, you don't want Zoom to go down, right? So Zoom has to rely on Amazon's data center as a service. You know, the same thing, our customers do not want their factory to go down. And if we can uh, deliver that as a service for them, like, look, our assembly lines don't get sick. They don't take breaks. They don't, uh, you know, they don't go on strike. They're always <laughs> there, no matter when you want them. And we guarantee that, that's hugely important to them. Yeah, and Misha, factories as a service, I guess, or manufacturing partners as a service, it's it's the same thing, isn't it? You don't want you don't want to rely on one single one single yeah. manufacturing. Well, I think even even more so. Ultimately, nobody really wants to buy um, you know some piece of capacity in a factory. What they need is product, right? And uh, yeah, uh, and I think uh, all yeah. delivery models are now as a service. Um, you know, if you were to listen to Gartner and some of the other uh, industry analysts, um, you know, they will talk, talk about goofy concepts like consumerization of manufacturing, whatever that means. But, but really what that means is, right, I mean, at one point, Napster was, um, you know, intended to be a way that will listen to music. And now music is an app where you, you, you know, you pull it up on your phone, and you click on something and music yeah. comes out of your phone, right? That is music as a service. And I think people are, you know, very, that, if that's what they mean by consumerization of manufacturing that I'm, I'm all in at the end of the day, you know, I would hate to sell somebody software that makes their uh, factory relationship smarter. Ultimately, they just need better manufacturing and that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I, I wanted to go on, Eric. No, I was actually asked to spin off on something and Amar, this is, I guess, specifically for you, I was reading about the work that you were doing with the non-human testing lines for COVID in yes. Israel. And I think that that's, I mean, that's a fantastic story, right? That allows both 24 seven testing of those things, but also minimizing the exposure, the potential exposure to the virus from a safety perspective. So can you tell us a little about that? Cause I think that's a great story. Yeah, so I, I think, um, 
You know, we find so when you think about automation, one of the use cases of automation is anything to do with safety. Right? People don't want to be near things that are, want humans to be near things that are dangerous. And so we were approached by this one hospital who looked at our technology and said, well, can you repurpose this for testing purposes? Like what we're doing with assemblies and things like that. So we put together, um, you know, we took our standard uh, modular um, robotic cell and programmed it to um, basically be the testing station for COVID-19. And so we have all this um, uh, logic built in. So, we, you know, the thing that we do with our robotic cells is we teach them using software how to carry something out, whether it's assembling something. And in this case, what we had to do was teach it a set of instructions on literally picking up, you know, the test tube, unscrewing it, dipping the, the swab in there for a certain period of time, rescrewing it, you know, having a control thing. So we did all of that and, um, and we were successful with it and we've now deployed it in the hospital and, you know, they can, uh, they get one, they get volume, as we say, it never stops, it keeps going on. It's safe, so the humans really don't have to do anything other than load the, the reagent, that, that the testing reagent, and all the actual mm -hmm. testing of the samples is done using the robot. And then it gives them the ability to scale. You were talking about copy exactly, which is like, look, we could go from one to 40 testing stations, like not overnight, but effectively, and, you know, just keep up with demand because we can, the same thing, once one robot learned how to do this, all our robots learned how to do this. They the others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I think that that was a, from a, it was very satisfying from a couple of perspectives. You know, one, the world needs some kind of way to handle the volume of testing. And if we can be part of the answer, great. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is just, you know, it's a, it's a great uh, challenge to see if we could yeah. teach our robots how to do this in a, in a quick fashion. So it was a great project yeah. to be involved in. And how quickly were you able to stand that process up as an example? Because that's a, a process that you are perhaps not expecting. Probably two months. I would say we put a team of like maybe three or four engineers on it and we did it in mm -hmm. two months. And you know that from a deployment cycle, like I was saying, automation has this myth of like, ah, nine months. No, we were able to do that in two months. And, and it's got intelligent vision and stuff like that in there. Mm -hmm. So it knows what it's doing. That was about two yeah. months. Yeah. yeah, a couple of a couple of um, trends in the market that I wanted to throw throw in, and a couple of terms. Um, one reshoring. We're hearing lots about concern about supply chain dependency in certain regions, and and the impact. So I'm I'm interested from both of you um, what you're seeing there, and then the other is resilience. I think a lot of people are asking about how supply chains become more resilient and maybe they're maybe they're connected misha how do you see how do you see the reshoring trend and are, are your customers coming to you and saying hey we need more supply chain diversity we need to be more resilient well i hope the reshoring uh, projections are real because that would be a, a massive boon for our business um but i but I, I i do think that they're heavily connected right part of the problem is that um, you know, we rely on not just uh, remote manufacturing in, in other countries where, as Amar said, there, these are very large uh, factories that are heavily centralized. I mean, we just saw uh, Foxconn come out and announce that the future is distributed manufacturing. And that's a mm -hmm. company that's built yeah. manufacturing city for, for very many years. So I think that's definitely coming. So I think part of it is just the closer it is to your customers, the less of a logistical route it has to take. And, uh, you know, Phil, you, you and I were in touch um, as the pandemic unfolded. And even when China came back online, it looked like production was back on again. But then um, all of a sudden, freight routes were slower, right? Yeah. And uh, because passenger planes, I didn't actually even know this, passenger planes weren't flying. So all of a yeah. sudden, air freight capacity Belly collapsed freight. all of a sudden, right? So yeah. mm -hmm. um, there was just unusual things going on. There was a flotilla, you know, in the in the Gulf of Mexico, full of oil, and those, yeah. you know, the, you know the, there there was just all sorts of strange things that were happening with supply chain routes and logistical routes that people weren't expecting. All of that is much easier when production is done 
uh, closer to you. So I think, uh, you know, resiliency is manufacturing closer to, um, to your shores. And I, and I don't necessarily think that means, um, you know, within your country. In fact, um, I think a lot of it just means uh, along the fault lines of where you have the most reliable trade agreements, right? For all practical purposes, there's not a massive difference between Canada, U.S., and Mexico at this point because USFCA yeah. and NAFTA um, is actually a very strong agreement and they're, you know, holds up very, very well. Mm -hmm. Even with a lot of saber rattling, it didn't just survive. It actually got, got better and I think it's going to be in yeah. place for a long time. So um, I think it's about being in a region where you have the most long-term stability and, uh, <clears throat> and also being distributed across multiple factories. There were factories in our network that, you know, some of them did experience temporary shutdowns. We were just able to reroute them, around them and none of our customers had to think about it, right? So I think those yeah. two topics are, are very connected. Yeah, and choice, choice drives that resilience to a certain extent, doesn't it? Amar, you have a resiliency fund. Tell us a little bit about that and tell us your view on the whole kind right. of reshoring resiliency issue. Right. So I, I think um, let's touch on both of those. I'll build on what uh, Misha said, which is um, we certainly have seen a, a rise in customer interest in both these topics, and they are connected. You know, people are one, you know, trying to uh, make their factories more resilient by being less reliant on human access and having dual locations where they can do manufacturing. And when they consider dual locations, a lot of them are actively looking at moving manufacturing to the United States or Mexico. So I would look at the number of projects we're involved in. There is a real num you know, large number of projects that are based in North America or, and, and, and Mexico. Um, and they are actively about moving products from China and, uh, and, and other parts of the world to, uh, to this location for all these reasons. So that the role that automation has played in that is making cost a, um, uh, a non-issue because you know automation basically costs the same no matter where you locate it. So we can yeah. deploy the same assembly line in Thailand or in uh, the United States for about the same cost. And the question is, where can you find skilled manpower that can operate that, you know? And so there's all this goodness of creating higher paying jobs in the, in the closer to the country that uh, you, you operate in. And in addition to what Misha was saying about the logistics, you also can improve the um, engineering iteration speed. Cause you don't, you know, people were flying. There was a time I, I, I heard that a certain company that whose name uh, is synonymous with fruit would take on the entire business class of flights going to China yeah. because that's what they were doing in terms of managing product introduction. Yeah. You no, know, so you don't have to do stuff like that if it's being built, you know, in, in, closer yeah. to you, right? Uh, yeah. So all of those things are good. Now, when it came to our resiliency fund, one of the things, conversations we kept having with customers were people going, "Hey, we like this idea. We want to get ahead of pandemic. We want to invest in automation." But CapEx is hard for us to come up with right now. We are ourselves facing a cash crunch. We've got customers who are not sort of out uh, buying from us. And so we have this sort of catch-22 problem of we want to go ahead, but we can't dedicate CapEx to go do it. And the thing that we ended up doing was through some financing partners that we, um, we found and, and, and partnered up with, we decided to take on that CapEx uh, um, burden. So we basically are funding automation installments or installations for our customers. So we take on the risk. We tell them for 12 months or however long they need to get to the other side of this COVID-19 economic crisis, we'll bear the burden of that cost. And then when you are up and running, you can start paying us. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it makes, it makes hiring a robot feel a little bit more like hiring other members of your team, which, mm -hmm. you know, from an OPEX point of view makes more exactly. sense. I think. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's interesting when I used to be on the consulting side to EMS and OEMs, we talked a lot about regionalization. So the discussion of reshoring to me always had kind of yeah. a political undertone, right? Where right. <laughs> we used to always say that the data seems to support regional build in region for yeah. region. That's a better every major region has its low cost 
you know, high cost, low cost to it, Europe, Asia, North America. Um, and Misha, you'll appreciate this as a fellow Texan. We used to always say, you know, <clears throat> if, if you're growing hay to feed cattle, the best place to do that is across the, in the field across the street, right? So get it yeah. closer to them uh, in that respect. So, so I'm, but I'm wondering though, Misha, with, I mean, you, you probably through your network see that a lot. Uh, do you see what's coming back or in, in a regional sense as stuff that always made more sense to keep here? It's the volumes are such that the complexity is such that it's, it's more appropriate to keep it here and, and the, the value proposition of China has changed? Um, I don't think a lot of consumer electronics is going to come back uh, and I'm not, and, and until we get to a point where everybody has a bright machine set up in their factories and the, you know, there's just an upside down equation. I'm working for you here, Amar. Uh, there's an upside down <laughs> equation for having a lot of hands because look, China is just unique in, in the number of yeah. people trained uh, well enough to, to just do fairly complex assembly. I mean, we're talking about level of miniaturization that mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we can even do reliably here, uh, either in US or, or Mexico. Uh, it requires a lot of people, it re, it, you know, until we can automate that, I'm not sure if it's feasible for that to, to reshore. Um, right. You know, most people don't realize how much production actually is done in, in North America already. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's a $540 billion market, I think, $80 billion never actually left. Uh, so that, you know, these are industries that uh, either have intellectual property concerns um, or um, as Amar said, um, the product changes more frequently than becomes feasible to go put it on a factory floor in Asia, right? Um, if you got to fly an engineer out there every couple of weeks uh, to change your product, and some products yeah. change that much, right? You know, when you, a lot of what people are building these days is IoT products and they go automate factories. Well, um, each one of those product iterations could be a different turn in terms of uh, a new product design. I don't think it makes any sense for that to be in Asia. No, it never did. And you know, in some cases, it, it didn't go there, right? So um, I think that's the kind of stuff that's going to start reshoring first and foremost. Uh, mm -hmm. anything, uh, I mean, the fact that 90% of our medical equipment is built in Asia uh, probably doesn't make sense. If for no other reason, they're just... At some point, when the, when a pandemic situation happens, you know, God forbid, we have a uh, we have some kind of a military situation. You need to have access to birth capacity, building more medical equipment. And if you don't have it here, uh, that's a difficult thing to go burst. We've seen, I mean, the the stories with automakers building ventilators are both fascinating in a patriotic sense, but also maddening in terms of. I mean, I was listening to you going, they're literally three D scanning uh, seven thousand mechanical parts. To build a ventilator yeah. in a car factory. I mean, that's what happens when it's not digitized, right? That's what happens yeah. when, uh, when there's no software involved. And I think these are things that are being exposed now as, you know, we got to get all of that digitized because scaling up um, ventilators from hundreds of units to thousands shouldn't be that difficult. It should require yeah. mobilizing yeah. car factories. Look, the dirty little secret is that it's not a good idea to build ventilators or any medical equipment in a car factory. You know, if you have, you have to one of those places, that is not where you want to build medical equipment, right? There's got to be a better way for that. And I think the technology is the right way to do it. Right? Yeah, and I think the truth is the right place to build it is a electronic manufacturing services company because they used to changeovers and it's an electronic manufacturing services company that's heavily automated and has a strong digital thread that allows them to uh, adapt and um, and pivot pivot really quickly, and I think that's the world that we need to move to. Amar, do you see? And you know, it's very rare that crises like this actually create change, but they can accelerate change. Do you see this as being a big accelerator for digital transformation? And does that? make you feel that we're actually moving not back to a status quo but actually to a better place as a manufacturing industry it's definitely an inflection point in the uh, the adoption curve i mean now look i think we've been in all these nice discussions around industry 4.0 and you know you've seen it's felt like a it's a lot of nice, discussion <laughs> yeah it felt like a nice thing to do like you know clean out the garage and you know organize your files like it's the right thing to do right but i think this is really just i, I think misha gave them great examples of like look it really hits you in the face when you can't ship product to your customers and maybe your competitor can 
And the, the difference between you and them is where they make the product, you know, literally, or who's supplying them the components. So it's yeah. definitely an inflection point. I think we've seen, uh, uh, you know, you look at the numbers, there's probably a rise, I think I've read somewhere that there's 40% more um, automation projects now underway in the last three months. So you're seeing it show up in act, people are putting uh, their money where their mouth is. And I do believe it's an inflection point, but look, it's a conservative industry. People who are sitting there on the production lines, there's still a little bit of like, oh, this software stuff sounds good, but does it really work, you know? So there's a couple yeah. more shoes that need to drop. <laughs> so for all the nice things I can say about how amazing our technology is, I'm sure somebody listening to the show goes, yeah, these guys, they're software guys. None of this stuff ever works, you know? Like they yeah. need a couple more proof points and then you can start to see what I think is definitely underway is your regionalization, resiliency, reshoring. I think automation, everybody sees as the answer. They just want proof points that they can, they can trust a company like us or Misha to say, here we are, we can do this for you as a service. And here's yeah. five people who've already done it at volume with us. You know? Well, that, that's it, isn't it? It's that classic thing of, um, you know, we've spent probably seven years talking about Industry 4.0 and we haven't seen those proof of concepts that have a really clear ROI, are really manageable and you can, you can absolutely understand. And that's, that's what's needed. And as you say, it's those five or 10 people that have done it, they've achieved this and it's delivered something very specific. And that's where, you know, that's where people will catch on, but it does seem that there's a strong appetite right now. So it's the right time to get that information out there. You know, one I thing I, I want to note is that um, it could, it, it feels like an inflection point that I think there is every reason in the world for a lot of supply chain uh, teams and a lot of uh, manufacturers to really start thinking about digitization seriously. It could also be a very cautionary tale where we look, you know, back 10 years from now and say, you know, we had all the motivation and all the reasons and we the didn't learn and trigger and didn't do it. And this is, you know, this will probably be a controversial opinion, but I think this is one area where we could use a little, a little bit more government, not less. Um, in fact, some of the, you know, some of the statutory constructs we have in place are very much antiquated. I mean, ju just think about the debate we had about how we should build ventilators. The reason that we had to use kind of you know fairly old uh, you know industrial production acts uh, where, to where we uh, nationalized certain industries is because at one point we turned a bunch of uh, automakers into uh, you know tank manufacturers, which made all the sense in the world. Well, how do you do it in the modern world where you know we don't have tanks, where we have our drones, right? And uh, yeah, uh, and I think from that perspective, you know we. You know, we think about things like build in, you know, build in America, but that becomes one of those things that just lobbyists use and abuse to, you know, to do crazy yeah. things. You'd be surprised yeah. how badly you can circumvent those kind of uh, acts. But I do think government has a role here. You know, it's, at some level, uh, we have to yeah. uh, encourage people to get into the 21st century and digitize. And there's nothing wrong with it. There are certain industries that do it themselves because they're consumer driven. And if you don't digitize, you know, some startup yeah, yeah. garage will do it for you, but overhauling factories takes real effort and real investment and knowledge that the demand's going to be there 10 years from now. And I think government has a role there. Right? Is that government's role in terms of encouragement, in terms of legislation, in terms of tariffs, or straightforward Japan style in terms of here's $2 billion to move our supply chains and to invest in automation? Is it, is it cold, hard cash? I think it's that, but I think it's also stronger standards management and, and stronger mm. uh, standards mandates, right? Uh, NIST, I don't think has been active enough uh, in this space. And I think they have a yeah. role to play. I mean, look, there are, there are ways we can uh, assure, because look, we've done this with uh, encryption, for example, right? Encryption industry yeah. does not exist without the government. It, the, you know, the yeah. ITF does not just come up with standards out of thin air, right? So... Um, so I think yeah. there, are, there, there are places where the government can encourage standard creation. I think they can also mandate that those standards are actually adhered to, at least in areas where government spends significant money. And I think from that yeah. perspective, could, could we have a package of, po of policies that 
uh, yeah. really encourage companies to truly digitize and actually say, look, if we want to go burst from zero to hundreds of thousands of uh, any sort of medical devices or mm. uh, defense uh, production, right? Uh, I think there is ways to get that done. And I think we need to get creative yeah. uh, about how, yeah. how, they, how they get started. One, one, yeah. one piece I think uh, government can uh, play a good role is in uh, reskilling or education. Because I think one of the things we yeah. keep talking about, you know, like I think automation is always made out to be the boogeyman, like, hey, it's going to take jobs, it's going to take jobs. Like any technology, you know, it substitutes labor. I mean, dishwashers took jobs. I mean, like it, literally you can go through Vacuum, you know, yeah. vacuum cleaners took jobs. Like electricity, electric motors took jobs. Like in the short run, it always displaces an existing modality, but what it creates is an opportunity to do something else. So I'd like to see the government get involved in creating vocational education for people for the you yeah. know sort of the next wave. And that would be an appropriate you know labor workforce that's skilled enough to deploy automation. Yeah. That kind of stuff would be, you know, very valuable. Yeah, it's a huge competitive issue, isn't it? The the skills that, that you have as a nation. Interestingly, Misha, to just go back to what you were talking about for a moment, the FDA have made some adjustments to the way they're asking people to report what's going on in their supply chain, and they are requiring some digitally enabled transparency in that supply chain which they clearly didn't have, and it clearly caused them some substantial problems. But it's just small pieces, and it needs to be this big uh, integrated policy that, that's built out, and it needs to take into account funding. By the way, I think it you needs just, to you just take into account education. Uh, avenue for the government to uh, foster this level of innovation. Uh, what you essentially mentioned right just now is traceability, right? I actually mm -hmm. have no idea how the products that I love yeah, I have a very good feeling about a lot of consumer products that I that I buy, but something tells me that the way the sausage is made is pretty ugly, right? And uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, um, and and I think this is one of the ways that uh, the traceability mandates could be a very strong positive. Traceability pretty much makes it uh, inevitable that we have to digitize and we have to know exactly who produced where, yeah. were they adults or were they children, right? I mean, the, these are all issues. Yeah. I think government could have a role. And I think this is actually where, when you, I mean, one of the things, one of the games I used to, I like to play now is just kind of look to see who's talking about supply chain now versus before. Uh, it is mentioned much more than before, right? And uh, we're yeah. talking about venture <clears throat> capitalists and, you know, people that just never yeah. thought about how this stuff gets made or all of us started thinking about, you know, how does this stuff actually work? Like if we actually wanted yeah. to be resilient, mm -hmm. you know, how, do, how does it actually function? So all of a sudden, you know, people that actually want to do the right thing, want to have ethical sourcing of their uh, of their products. These are things that I think we actually could mandate, and I think yeah. trade agreements could could be structured uh, in, uh, yeah. in order to harness them. Right. And curiously, there's probably better traceability on that sausage than there is on some of the electronic devices sure. you buy, which is a Absolutely. which is a bit of a concern. <laughs> You know, I, I keep thinking we, we started talking about the pandemic and its impact and as horrible as obviously it has been in the cost of it. You know, it's also, it motivates some change, right? And behaviors and it's, and it's accelerated many things. Um, actually, I grew, uh, my son graduated high school here a few weeks ago and the valley, we, we got to do the graduation out on a big field spread apart. It was wonderful. <clears throat> but the uh, valedictorian made a comment when, as they always do and he expressed concern for his generation. He said, listen, I'm really worried because it's taken 18 years in a pandemic to learn to wash our hands properly here. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. hopefully yeah. there's some continual behavioral changes and, and, and yeah. acceleration of a lot of these trends coming out of this um, unfortunate event that we're all living through. So, but, Listen, I'm aware of the time, and it's kind of my job to manage that and be respectful of all of your schedules. Um, I always hate the end of webinars because they seem to end so abruptly, and you say goodbye, and the screen goes black. So um, let me just say to, both, to Misha and Amar especially, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedules to share with us here today um, your insights and your thoughts on the industry. I think this has been an excellent conversation, and yeah. I think the the audience has appreciated it. Bill, as always, always good to, to, to be with you and spend time. You had so much. Thank you.
Um, we have several more of these scheduled on a two-week basis coming. I think the next one has to do with leadership in the EMS space, which is a, yeah. an interesting one. And then we're going to yep. focus on Europe as well, the industry in Europe and what's happening over there in July. So Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to ask a Mars question about government and education on that one when we when we talk to the recruitment guys next in two weeks time. So we'll uh, we'll have a nice segue in there. Yes, we will. We will. So anyway, gentlemen, again, thank you for your time. We very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Right. Stay Cheers. safe.